140. The Cult of Victimization. Calcedon Position Paper, number 71. February 1986. The Romantic movement marked a major change in the world's history and fathered many revolutions. Not only was it a major intellectual force, but it was, at the same time, a powerful popular movement, affecting all classes. Christianity had earlier been unique in being so great a popular movement, and one which reached into all segments of society. Centuries later, the witchcraft cults represented also a great popular movement, and an evil one. Although the Enlightenment was an anti-popular movement, marked by a contempt for the common man and a depreciation of women, it set the stage for Romanticism. By making nature a substitute for God, the Enlightenment paved the way for the romantic exaltation of the state of nature. It was Jean-Jacques Rousseau who brought together the various ingredients to unleash the Romantic movement. First of all, there was the idealization of nature as the state of innocence and the denigration of civilization as the fall of man. Karl Marx, as a romantic, simply substituted capitalism for civilization. Instead of being conformed to and remade by God, man, to be saved now, simply had to be himself. The, quote, noble savage, end quote, and the simple peasant gained status as the true people. Marx converted this into the worker class as the bearers of the true humanity needing freedom. Second, because man's salvation now was no longer a second birth in Christ, but to recapture the innocence of his first birth, egoism was exalted and the self-centred hero became an idol. Byron's poems exalt such men repeatedly. Romantic love has been defined as the dream of a universe peopled by two alone, where they and time stood still. Love and marriage previously had been a relationship, not only between two persons, but between two families, and it was based on a unity of faith and life. Now it became possession, and Faust told Mephistopheles, Get me the girl! With every man as his own god and idol, the purpose of sex was possession, exploitation, and abandonment. The romantic poet Shelley saw every girl he desired to possess as a goddess. Afterwards, if she wanted an ongoing relationship, she became a witch. Third, because time passes, romantics, as would be gods, mourn mutability, change, a constant theme in their writings and sadness became the romantic posture. All happiness was lined with sadness, because nothing stays the same. The romantics felt perpetually thwarted. They were the innocent victims of God and time, and they hated both. As a result, people believed at times more in dying for love than living for love, because life is only frustration to the passionate ego. The same is true of love. Consummated love for the romantic begins to perish. The romantics took a perverse pleasure in frustration. It vindicated their view of life. Fourth, reason and logic were downgraded and even despised by some in favour of passion and feeling. William Blake expressed such sentiments most plainly. As a result... Sentimentality, which had emerged earlier as a reaction against the Enlightenment, began to predominate in literature. The earlier sentimentality was still tied to moral concerns, but increasingly the focus was feeling. People became sensitive to their every emotion and feeling, and Western man became introspective on a pathological scale. Novelists devoted books to exploiting the sensitive souls of romantic persons, and the essence of the modern novel 
film and television story is not an intelligent content or point, but the exploitation of feelings for their own sake. Fifth, since Romanticism stressed the ego of individual man, it stressed his remarkable and divine uniqueness. At the same time, it stressed the uniqueness of various nationalities, their origins and folklore, and nationalism became a governing force in European life and thought. It was, moreover, a nationalism which displaced Christianity as the focal point of life. Just as for the romantic hero, the good of the individual is paramount and takes precedence over all other considerations. So for the nation. In the romantic faith, the good or concern of the nation is the highest good and takes precedence over Christian concerns. National self-interest went hand in hand with a belief in national superiority and self-glorification. Every nation and would-be nation saw in itself a manifest destiny in humanistic terms. In earlier eras, men felt loyal to a lord or a king, not to the nation as such. Now, allegiance was to a nation-state, and many minorities began to agitate for what came to be seen as the only true freedom, a nation-state. Napoleon was himself a figure of the Romantic faith, but in establishing a European empire, he ran counter to the stirrings of nationalism and created a full-blown nationalistic fervour in one area after another. This same impulse for national freedom, which is not the same as a free society, has led to the post-colonial states of Africa and Asia and their tyrannies. In India, national freedom has led to tyrannies and mass killings undreamed of in Mughal and British eras. Thus, while Romanticism stressed at the beginning the individual, it came in time to stress the freedom of the national state, or the worker state, or a racial state, at the cost of personal freedom. Sixth, at the same time, the Romantic movement, by requiring impossible and egocentric hopes of men and nations, cultivated an ugly response in men, pseudo-masochism, Mario Prats and other scholars of the Romantic temper have documented this tradition in literature in the 19th century. History has given us the documentation in life in the 20th century. Its governing impulse is a sense of victimization. Communist revolutions are made possible by creating a sense of being victimized in the people. The result is a sadistic revolutionary destructiveness and then the even more vicious suppression of the people in the name of the revolution and a masochistic acceptance. Hitler's National Socialism began with an appeal to this sense of victimization. The world powers, it was held, had cruelly victimized Germany, but in their own midst, the Jews had been the conniving agents of that victimization. As a result, the Jews had to be punished when it was over. The Germans were also victims. The people of the Austro-Hungarian Empire saw themselves as victimized. They have now a much more thorough oppression than they had ever remotely experienced. With more and more peoples, victimization became their version of the past. Ireland was certainly long brutally oppressed by the English, but at the same time, it manifested a resistance, a verve, and an inner spirit of remarkable character. With Romanticism, only the bleak aspects of its past became important. The Jews in Europe were certainly oppressed at times, but they were also vigorous in their development and power during long eras. With Romanticism, the Jewish self-image began to shift from the chosen people to the victim people, and even in America, with freedom and prosperity, this self-concept remains with more than a few. Similarly, the Armenians, 
with a remarkable history and with cities which remained free to World War I, forgot their many triumphs to think instead of their defeats and massacres. Real enough, but not their total history. But this is not all. Amazingly, powerful nations like the United States, Britain, France and Japan are not lacking in numbers of peoples who are sure that their country has been exploited and abused by other nations. Before long, at this rate, the school bully will be going to the counsellor to cry about being victimised. All over the world, men and nations wallow in self-pity and a belief that they have been victimised. The cult of victimization is perhaps the most popular religion of our time. Shortly after World War II, some psychiatrists, notably Dr. Burglar, commented on the growing trend on the part of many people to find a perverse pleasure in defeat. The world is then seen as too coarse and evil to tolerate the sensitive and pure soul, and defeat becomes a vindication of one's nobility and purity. Criminals are prone to the same perspective. They see themselves often as the victims of society. Anyone who has done even a little work with prisoners soon finds that this self-pity and sense of victimization is very prevalent. One police officer with some experience with vice squads said that he found prostitutes and homosexuals uniformly rotten and full of self-pity and a sense of victimization to the core of their being. Worst of all, all too many churchmen seem to believe and teach that victimization is a proof of holiness. One could say that, for them, the more one is willingly victimized, the holier one becomes. I have regularly encountered persons who, while undergoing hellish abuse, find many who seem to manifest loving concern and friendship. When, however, they took successful steps to deliver themselves from evil, these quote-unquote Christian friends turned in them. Several times lately, I have heard from people who have been told to surrender to repulsive evils because they will then be suffering for Christ's sake. This is not Christianity. It is the cult of self-victimization and masochism. It produces an entirely bogus religiosity. Such a bogus religiosity cannot produce a free people. The world has been moving into slavery because people refuse to recognize that the biblical word salvation means deliverance, health and victory. The party of defeat is the devil's party. The devil is the one who sees himself eternally as the victim of God's arbitrary ways. In the temptation of our Lord, the three alternatives offered by Satan all presuppose man as God's victim. If you are truly a son of God, says Satan, how can you let people go hungry? By a miracle, turning stones into bread solves the economic problem and make work unnecessary. Again, says Satan, walking by faith is painful and difficult for man. Use the angels to perform a mighty public miracle, so that men may walk by sight, not by faith. Finally, Satan says, Worship me, not God. Recognize that I am right in saying that God's plan makes man a victim, and that man is not a sinner, but a victim of God's harsh ways. Our Lord does not argue. He simply says, It is written, God has spoken, and his truth prevails. It is reality, not man's self-pity. The cult of victimization and its sense of self-pity has its immediate roots in Romanticism. Its ultimate origin is the satanic insistence on the will of the creature rather than the creator. With this began man's fall, and with it continues man's misery. Salvation is Christ, resurrection, deliverance, health, 
and victory.